So welcome to Church of the Shepherd. Uh, we are glad you're joining us online for this service. This is our opportunity to be able to dedicate some time and attention to God, allow God to speak to us in a way that God is desperate to speak. I want to share with you a scripture. Um, also, I want to introduce myself. My name is Stephen Blair. I am the online campus pastor here at Church of the Shepherd. The scripture I was telling you about, it comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 16. Give to the Lord all families of the nations. Give to the Lord glory and power. Give to the Lord the glory due his holy name. Bring gifts into his presence. Bow down to the Lord in his holy splendor. Yes, God set the world firmly in place. It won't be shaken. This scripture was a call for people to come from different areas and different directions into one location to be able to have one purpose, to praise and worship God. And that's what we're doing here today. So I invite you to join with us uh, together, no matter where you are or when you're watching this, to be able to sing a praise song to God uh, through the songs and leadership that follow. I invite you to sing together at this time. Sing, he's coming on the clouds. Kings will bow down and Every chain will break Broken hearts declare His grace Who can stop the Lord Almighty? And our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah is roaring with power And fighting our battles Every knee will bow before Him. And our God is Lamb, a Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is lying, lying of Judah. He's roaring with power, fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before the Lord Almighty Who can stop the Lord Almighty Who can stop the Lord Almighty Who can stop the Lord Let's sing this together Who can stop them? Who can stop the Lord Almighty Sing if you need it Who can stop the Lord Almighty this is the true church. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Thy God is lion, lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Slain 
we're glad you joined us today. Uh, please take a moment to text us the word new if this is your first time, and then also text us the word regular if this is uh, not the first time you've ever joined us with online worship. This gives us an opportunity to reach back to you and let you know we appreciate you joining. I um, also want to point out uh, that we have an opportunity for you to give offering. Uh, this is a way to return to God uh, acts of, of worship in other ways in addition to just singing, in addition to giving God attention. Um, you can give offering through the app, through our website, or through mailing a check to our physical address. Uh, no matter how you give, just remember why you give, that this is just an act of saying, God, you're important to me, and this is one way I'm going to show it. With that, I invite you to join with me in a moment of prayer. Let's bow our heads. God, we are thankful for the goodness that you have given us throughout the last few days. The kindness and forgiveness that we can experience from you is both surprising and dependable. Help us to lean on you right now. Help us to lean on you for uh, support and comfort Help us also lean upon you to do more than just comfort us, but to lean on you for a greater purpose. Enlarge our hearts. Lead us to where you want to take us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to Pay attention to the unveiling and the opening of scriptures in this uh, next sermon by Pastor John Spaulding. A successful advertising slogan is one that plays in your mind over and over again. You can see it, you can hear it, and, and the image just kind of sticks. And you're still humming it throughout the day or you're, you're hearing those words over and over. And, and the advertiser is banking that as those words go over in your mind and those images go over in your mind that pretty soon you're going to want that. You're going to desire that. And, and you're not going to think of anything else but that until you have it. And, you know, those phrases, if, if you're like me, some of those phrases you've heard as you were a youth growing up, and even though those products aren't even on the market anymore, you still know some of those slogans. You still think about them. And even though you can't buy that product, you still kind of desire it when you think about it. One of those for me, and it still does exist, but it's that phrase that was about in the 80s, and it was the phrase, milk, it does the body good. It promoted the drinking of milk for strong bones and brawny kind of muscles that were good and desirable for the body. And it gave us the impression that milk was good for the body. Now, I think we would all agree that milk is not the only thing that's good for our body. I mean, exercise is good for our body. You know, sleep is good for our body. Milk alone won't do it. Eating right, exercise, all these things are good for us. Less stress, that's even good for us. These all are good for the body, mind, and soul. But what about the body of Christ? What is it that builds up the body of Christ? What is it that does the body of Christ good? You know, we are in a moment and place and time where the body of Christ is needed in our world. Maybe even more than ever in our lifetimes. The presence of the living Christ with the fullness of God's power, grace, love, mercy, forgiveness, justice, and hope are needed not only by each one of us. They are needed in our culture. They are needed in our country. They are needed in the world in which we live. And yet at the same time that this is what the world and we really need, we have never been more divided or more hostile towards each other and even the church itself. At the time when the church is needed, when the message of the gospel, which has the power to transform and change lives, is needed, 
Why is it that the body of Christ is seemingly less effective than ever before? Why has the body of Christ, the church, been losing our influence at a time when the culture most needs it? Why is it that even within the church, we even find ourselves not united but divided in those kinds of ways? Why is it that we have these factions? You know, when those outside the church are, are looking for and longing for the purpose and answers that the gospel can give, the message that we send is often unclear. They aren't able to see how they love one another within us. And we're unclear about what really unites us, what's needed most what Jesus prayed for us, and what God designed for us, that we might be one in Him, that we might know and live in the unity with other believers, that this one gift, unity, this one way of being, again, unity, is what the body most needs and what the body most wants. So what is it that is preventing us from living in unity or experiencing the unity that God desires. I don't want to start with what's blocking that. Instead, I want us to take a look at what the unity is that God really desires, the kind of unity that God is looking for. Unity in, is in God's definition is not that we all look alike. It's not that we all sound alike. It's not that we all think alike. Unity is not about being a robot and just repeating the same things. Unity, remember, begins in the life of God. We are led by a God who not only desires unity, but lives in unity with himself. And you remember we talked about this some last week even, the, the idea of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's God in perfect unity. God is in three different unique forms, three different unique expressions of the one God, all performing different functions, living in complete unity with himself. Now, that's not only who God is, that's the goal for our life, that we were made in this image with differing gifts, with differing functions, looking, sounding, living different lives, but all for the same purpose. That's what we are meant to be in that kind of way. But it's not easy. I mean, we all have moments when we get torn in different directions, and we all even have moments when we may be even in conflict with our own desires and thoughts. And in those moments when you add other people in, other people who are different than us, we are pushed and pulled once more. And unity seems something that's way beyond our grasp. But remember, we are led by and formed by and loved by and empowered by one God. Who is one and who desires oneness. The same God lives inside each believer. This one God lives inside each believer. It's not a different God. It's the one God who lives within each one of us. And if this one God is inside of every believer, this one God seeks unity, guess what this one God is working for in your life and in my life? Unity. And here's how it works. When we accept Jesus and invite him into our lives, the fullness of God enters into our being. Just, now, just repeat that. With, you know, just think about that. Repeat it with me even. When we accept Jesus into our lives, the fullness of God enters into our being. Now just picture that for a moment. The fullness of God enters you. The full power of God, the full grace of God, the full love of God, the full hope of God, the full mind of God, the full mercy of God. We can keep going down that list. We're talking about the fullness of God enters into you. Now that's a concept. The moment that we accept Jesus, all of that fullness 
comes to live within us. That's life-changing. I mean, that's transformational. That's really what it means to be born again, is that our old self has died, this new self has come, and we put on this new self, this fullness of God is what we begin to live out. Everything is different. The fullness of God's image of God's being and with us, living in us, flowing through us, that's all right there. In Paul's words, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. When we think about it in that kind of way, being born again is not just a momentary kind of moment. It's not just something that's once and done. No, it's, it's something that is ongoing. It's a continual experience of the fullness of God, allowing us to live every day experiencing the life of God here and always in our lives. Every day Christ is living in me and I am every day becoming more and more aware of the fullness of God. I am every day becoming more and more formed in His image. This God moves into our being, changes everything, every relationship, every desire, every thought, every action. This is a God that becomes the God that we worship. It's worth worshiping. Now, if you and I have experienced this fullness of God, this life-changing love of Jesus, then that naturally overflows with the love of God for others. It's that simple. It's that simple. If that fullness of God is within us, then there's nothing else that can come out of our lives except that kind of love, that kind of hope, that kind of power, that kind of promise. Because that's what lives within us. That's what's flowing out into our relationships, our thoughts, and our words. So the question becomes, if I have said yes to Jesus, is that fullness present in my life? Have I seen, have you seen God growing in you? Is your capacity to love your brothers and your sisters no, not just your brothers and your sisters, but all your brothers and your sisters, is that capacity growing? Are you growing in your desire to forgive and be reconciled with others? Or are you keeping people at arm's length? Are you filled with the fullness of God and being one with God? I mean, if you are, then these desires... These actions will be growing within us. Now, that doesn't mean we won't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that we won't have moments when we, don't, when we get it wrong. But the desire to be united will be growing within us. It's that desire to love others, that desire, is it growing greater than your own opinions, your own thoughts, your own desire of pride? Now, some will say, John, that's just simply not possible. I mean, we are human after all. And it is impossible for everyone to agree all the time and to live that kind of unity. I, I agree. That's true. Division, it's inevitable. But in the early church, as united as they were, sharing everything, holding everything in common, growing in faith, adding to their numbers daily, those who are being saved, there was also division. And Paul had this observation about the church that was living in Corinth. Paul made this observation about division and what we should learn from those divisions. Here, here's what Paul writes in, uh, in his letter to the Corinthians. Regarding this next item, I'm not at all pleased. I'm getting the picture that when you meet together, it brings out your worst side instead of your best. First, I get this report on your divisiveness, competing with and criticizing each other. I'm reluctant to believe it, but there it is. The best that can be said for it is that the testing process will bring truth into the open and confirm it. 
See, Paul recognizes that divisions are going to exist. There are going to be folks who say they believe who don't really. There are going to be folks who just don't believe. And there's going to be conflict that happens. So division is going to exist. But here what Paul says is the purpose of those divisions. That even when we fail, even when we don't get it right, that those moments can become moments of testing for us in our faith. And that process of testing is meant and intended to discern whether or not we are full of the fullness of God. What's more, Paul says, and everybody is going to know. I mean, for Paul, it's very simple. You know, if, if people look at your life and they see you dividing, and they see you criticizing, and they see you, you, you uh, making things uh, that work against unity, people are going to look at you and say, ah, the fullness of God is not in them. Now, it sounds harsh, but it's reality, and that's what the world actually does, isn't it? When they look at the church right now, and they, and they see the church divided, they see the church arguing and, and, and squabbling about this or that, or, or not getting along with each other, isn't that exactly what they're doing? Oh, the fullness of God is not in them. And, and we find ourselves in that kind of spot then. Everyone, Paul says, is going to know that your faith isn't genuine when you find yourselves divided like that. Now, it can happen so easily. We, we, it can happen when we find ourselves passing on gossip, even when it sounds like a prayer concern. We, we can hear it happen easily when we tear someone down, believers or non-believers, when we're maybe even disagreeing or arguing or confronting each other on simple things or, or, or arguing about political issues or arguing about uh, things that are happening out in the world. And, and all of these things are just tearing down and wearing down the body of Christ. We are not witnessing the humility and the acceptance and the grace and the welcome of Jesus. And these moments, when we become aware of them, they can become moments not to press on in our arrogance, not to press on in our own pride, but they can become moments of self-discovery. They can become moments in the scripture when God's people repented, when they became more aware of God's grace and mercy in their own lives. They can become moments of growth. And that's what Paul is actually saying to the church at Corinth. When those moments happen, pay attention to them. Change your ways. Repent and love one another. See, he realizes that division is inevitable. And not only is it inevitable, but he also recognizes it's going to be a sign of separating those who are full of the Spirit from those who are not. And he notes how it is that we are to deal with each other in those moments. Jesus even had those moments. He, he told us when you can't reach agreement with each other, when you have something against your brother or your sister, go and talk to them in love. Have a conversation with them. And, and then if that doesn't work, then take a witness along with you and have another conversation with them. And only if those things don't work, only if it's impossible to bridge that kind of gap, then and only then do you separate yourselves from each other. I mean, the desire to live in unity, the desire to bring each other together, that's high. In the same way, being a Christian is not about making a, a claim of, of faith or a claim of religion. It's about being a follower of Jesus who has entered into and been filled with God's love, Christ's love, and that's pouring out in his love to each other, that's the evidence that we are walking with Jesus. The Apostle John in his first letter, 1 John, writes over and over about the love of God being within us and what that produces. And he warns that there are things that will happen that will show that that love is not within us and, and the result of that will be that there will be no fruit in our lives. 
Now those words are not meant as judgment or condemnation. They're meant as a point of reflection. That in those moments when we realize that fruit is not coming out of our lives, that's a time to be more intimate with Jesus. It's a good read, 1 John. I commend it to you this week and, and encourage you to take a look at it and see if that fruit is happening in your own life. In the same way, if these things are not happening in your own life, it might not be happening within the body of Christ either. And then it's time for us to invite Jesus into the body of Christ once more, challenging us to become aware, challenging us to call each other back to a right relationship with God. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says, If we claim that we experience a shared life with him and continue to stumble around in the dark, we're obviously lying through our teeth. We're not living what we claim, but if we walk in the light, God himself being the light, we also experience a shared life with one another. As the sacrificed blood of Jesus, God's son, purges all our sin. I mean, I think this is what, what's happening in our world right now. You know, when, when others outside of us look at the church and they call us hypocrites, this is exactly what they're talking about. We say one thing, but it looks like something else, and, and, and Christ isn't in us. I know that's true for me. I, I, I mean, I, I love Jesus. I love God. I, I want unity. But gosh darn it, sometimes when somebody does something hurtful to me, I still got a grudge. When somebody says something hurtful about me, I still sometimes want to say something back. I, I'm not perfect in that. But what I am working for is to more and more desire to forgive. More and more to desire to be in unity. More and more to desire to be one with them. And when we live with the fullness of God within us, that's what happens. That's when we're able to live with the assurance of our salvation. Then and only then will we live our lives and the signs of a life of faith present. Then and only then will we be the body of Christ, be effective in our witness and influence in our community once more. Then and only then will our faith move from being lukewarm to being full on, fully committed all in. Now, now here's the key. If we settle for lukewarm, if we settle for less than the fullness of God within us, then we are settling for division rather than unity. If our desire is not there for the fullness of God, then the question comes up, have we really even accepted Christ fully in our lives? Now, it's true that lukewarm believers, they can still experience fellowship. They can still pray. They can still read the Bible. They, they can still understand things, concepts about salvation and still think about heaven and those kinds of pieces. But there won't be any fruit. And there'll be no evidence growing in their lives of gentleness and peace and patience and self-control. There won't be an evidence of unity. Unity comes and exists only when we connect with people who are filled with the Spirit and connect fully with God. It comes from lives being fully surrendered. I mean, take these two folks in the Gospel of Luke, Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler. Zacchaeus, they don't go to the same church, by the way. Zacchaeus is a tax collector, and he climbs up into a sycamore tree one day to see Jesus because he wants to see and be near Jesus. And Jesus calls him down and speaks to him and goes to his house, and, and there they have a party, and, and, and Jesus says that salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house that day. And Zacchaeus, in turn, then surrenders his wealth, gives his wealth away to anybody who he has harmed and, and pays them back fourfold, and turns his life around. And, and surrenders his life to Jesus. The rich young ruler, on the other hand, comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and, and Jesus says, you know, what well, you know, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. And the rich young man says, done that, been there, got it, check, ready to go. And Jesus says, and then you need to surrender everything. You need to give up everything and come follow me. And the rich young man says, no, no, no. Too high a price. Can't do that. Not going to be able to move on to that. See, surrender. 
surrendering our pride, surrendering our opinions, surrendering our way of being things, that's key to having a life in the fullness of Christ. Jesus asked his disciples to leave everything and come follow him, and they did. And we discover that you know salvation is lived out in us and grows in us. We call that process of growing in us sanctification, where we become more and more like Jesus every single day. And while sanctification is a mark of maturity, it's the way that we show that we're growing in Christ-likeness, it only is possible when we surrender. Surrender is the beginning point. It's the beginning of becoming like Jesus. Chan writes, as a result of sanctification, you will surrender more fully, readily, and joyfully. But it's a mistake to believe that surrender is the mark of maturity and not a requirement for salvation. If we're going to discover true unity, if we're going to discover the unity that we need that does the body good, we have to be willing to surrender. The act of surrender leads us to unity. It leads us to the fullness of God. It leads us to surrendering our pride, our arrogance, our desire, and replacing it with the love of Jesus, the love of others, the love of God. There will always be a struggle for us to place things at Jesus' feet. But there must always be a desire to do so. This is the path that leads us to unity. This is the path that prevents us from being divided. This is the path that leads us to the fullness of Christ. When we live our lives in this way, we are seeking unity with all believers, those who are just beginning and those who have been at it for a while, those who are weak and those who are strong, those who are young and those who are old, those who sing hymns and those who sing praise songs, those who immerse and those who sprinkle. We are of one heart and one mind to worship God. Jesus wants us to be one like that. So let's do a little self-check. How is the fullness of God present in your life today? On a scale of one to 10, how does your life reflect the fullness of God? What is your desire for the fullness of God today? And what is it that you need to surrender so that that fullness can be more present in your life? Would you pray with me? Gracious God, once more we, we ask you to enter into our midst to be fully present with us that we might be fully in you and you might be fully in us. Allow us to see the places in our lives that we create division, that prevent us from experiencing your fullness and seeing the fullness of you in others. Allow us, O oh God, today to surrender our pride and our arrogance, our hurt and our pain to you. And as we place it at your feet, allow us once more to live in fullness of your grace and your love. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. At this time of worship, we're going to take part in what's called the passing of the peace. And in a formal way, this often looks like one person saying, the peace of Christ be with you, and somebody else returning back the phrase, and also with you. But in an informal way, this looks like any act of warmth or kindness you share with another person uh, through a phone call, through a text message, that lets them know that you're thinking about them. And in that conversation, it's like the peace of Christ was passed from one person to the other. So go ahead and pause if you need to pause right now to be able to express this act of kindness and warmth to another person to extend the love of Christ in their direction. And after you do that, I invite you to pay attention to the next steps. Uh, we here at Church of the Shepherd have started a fall kickoff series of small groups. And this includes Alpha, which is a deep dive into the scriptures. Uh, the version we're at right now is a deep dive into the Old Testament. 
that might unveil parts of it you may have never read before and understand different parts of it that, that you may have thought were going to paint God in one way, but in reality, it's a much more loving and forgiving picture of God than you thought existed in the Old Testament. I invite you to sign up for that. Uh, there's also an online class for Alpha, which is a way to begin this pursuit of faith, uh, especially if you're somebody who is just new to this conversation. If you want to ask questions, this is an opportunity for you to do that. Um, I get a chance to lead the Alpha Online group, so this is an opportunity for me to have a uh, one-on-one -on -one conversation with you through Zoom as well. We also have Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, which is both in person and online. And lastly, we have a confirmation class for sixth through eighth graders that is both in person and online as well. So go ahead to our website underneath news and updates and underneath there, go ahead and sign up for all these different ways where you can take the next step in your faith together. Uh, lastly, we invite you to receive a final word of blessing as you go off into your week. Know that God has created us to live in unity with one another and that prayer and love does a body good and does a soul good too. Go and enjoy and experience the unity of Christ. Amen.